Today's video is brought to you by storyboardthat.com. Please visit teachercast.net slash storyboardthat for a limited time offer. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the TeacherCast podcast. You are listening to the podcast that brings you the best in educational technology right from the app developers themselves. I am thrilled today that you have chosen to make TeacherCast your home for professional development. Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Jeff Bradbury, and if this is the first time you're joining us today, thank you so much. Welcome to episode 100. And 19. We have so many great things happening on TeacherCast. I want to point out a few great things, of course, over on our website, teachercast.net. We have put together a great podcast that we actually recorded last night all about Star Wars. If you're one of those fans of that series where they're dealing with the Force and the Wookiees and the, and the Ewoks, you will be happy to know that we just came out with episode two called Introducing Star Wars in the Classroom to create awesome lesson plans for your students. We had our guests on from The Force Awakens and from Coffee with Kenobi podcast and with Star Wars in your classroom. We had a great 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 time so certainly check that out of course all of our podcasts can be found over on our teachercast.net slash podcasting app and of course if you're looking to start your own podcast or your own blog check out our brand new channel educational podcasting today that's educationalpodcasting.today. And of course, there are several great ways that you can help us out and participate in our show. We love it when you go over and follow us on Twitter at TeacherCast. Leave us a voicemail at teachercast.net slash voicemail. Email us at feedback at teachercast.net. And of course, subscribe and review this great show over on teachercast.net slash iTunes and teachercast.net slash YouTube. And again, thank you so much and welcome to our 119th episode. We are doing some great things over here. Today's show is all about student achievement and things that students can do if they're gifted and talented. My guest today is Katie McCarthy, who is the leader of the Center for College and Career Success. I want to bring on Katie today. Katie, welcome to the show. How are you today? Thank you. I'm having a great day. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, my name is Katie McClarty, and I am director of the Center for College and Career Success at Pearson in our Research and Innovation Network. I lead a team of researchers um, with the goal of having all students having opportunities for college and career success because they know the knowledge and skills and abilities that are needed to be successful and can track their progress along the way. Well, let's take a look at some of the stuff that you're doing here. The website, of course, is researchnetwork.pearson.com. Tell us a little bit about some of the work that you're doing and how we can learn more about the great things happening over at Pearson these days. Sure. The Research and Innovation Network is actually a set of six research centers. And so, like I said, I lead the Center for College and Career Success, but we also have five other centers. And they're really, the topics are dedicated to, to those areas that we think are um, big issues today in education. So there's a whole center on educator learning and effectiveness one on digital data analytics and adaptive learning, next generation assessments and learning, learning science and technology, and product development and efficacy research. So we've got a, a team of researchers all tackling different topics and working together to solve some of these education challenges. How did you and like get, I said, I lead the college and career success, one of those six centers. How did you get interested in doing all this research? Um, I actually have a, an, I could say an interesting background. Um, a variety of interests. My PhD is actually in social and personality psychology. So I've I've had an interest in sort of um, people and their learning and their how their personality interacts with their environments. But I also spent a lot of time working in summer programs and volunteering in schools with gifted students and with teachers and learners. And so um, coming to Pearson, I had the opportunity to put those pieces together to really think about how it factors of the students, factors of the school, um, interact and in really helping to build programs and conduct research to help students have opportunities in the future and really help develop their potential. 
Now, today, in fact, I was listening to Blog Talk Radio, and I heard you talking about a great article that was recently written called, Should I Accelerate My Gifted Child? And it was fascinating. Let me bring up the, the, the research here page. And this, of course, is over at researchnetwork.pearson.com. We're going to have it in the show notes here under uh, TeacherCast Podcast 119. Talk to us a little bit about this, Katie. Should we accelerate a gifted child? Aren't gifted children accelerated already? Sure. Um, this is a question that I think parents struggle with. And over the last couple of years, I've had the, the fortune of getting to work with a couple of parents who are thinking about this challenge. And what I like to say is when, when parents are trying to decide if they should accelerate their student, they know they have a high ability student who's performing, you know, quite a bit above grade level, isn't really being challenged in the classroom. When they're thinking about acceleration, specifically sort of grade skipping or moving to the next to that next grade level, they're not worried about what I call, um, well, what everyone calls, right? The three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. I tend to see more of the worry about what I call the three D's, the driving, dating, and drinking. It's really about what's gonna happen in the long term. So, you know, we have a good feeling that my son or daughter will be prepared for next year and will be able to meet the curriculum then. But what happens later when they're, you know, the youngest person, other kids can drive before they can, or they're the youngest person who's entering college or they're having to, you know, they're going out into the work world with people who are older than they are. Are they still going to be able to keep up? And what are some of those long-term outcomes? And so that's really where I focus my research is on the long-term outcomes of academic acceleration, both in terms of high school performance, college performance, and career outcomes. When do students usually get the opportunity to skip a grade? Is this something that usually happens third, fourth, fifth? I mean, I know teaching high school, we don't have a lot of freshmen become seniors. Right. Yeah, there's when you think about acceleration, there's many different forms and grade skipping, I think, is most common in the early years. Um, there's there's early entrance programs. There are several states that will allow early entrance into kindergarten or into first grade, as well as skipping grades within elementary school or even you know an early skip into middle school. And then the other way you can think about it is, is there are schools that will allow early graduation from high school in order to start college early. So all of those can be forms of grade skipping, but I would say it's most common in those earlier years. Now, I do know of a person, I think very famous, who graduated high school and I think nine became a doctor. His last name is Hauser or something like that. Is that what we're talking about? Are we looking at students that, that are rapidly accelerating and do have the requirements or the ability to go to college at 11? So that the term when you typically have two or three years of acceleration, like the uh, Doogie Hauser example, is called radical acceleration. And that does happen, but it's much less frequent. There are programs, um, the University of Washington has a great early entrance program really designed for students, I think, starting around the age of 14 or 15. But that's much less common. Um, we think about acceleration, typically it's, it's a, maybe a one year Get one year acceleration, or even you can think about it if you're not ready for a full grade level, there's a lot of times where we do a single subject acceleration. So you might have a student who's particularly talented in mathematics and they go into, you know, a second grader will go into the third or fourth grade classroom. Or if you think about particularly in middle school or high school, there's a lot of times where students can accelerate and take advanced courses in a single subject area. And advanced placement is another great example of acceleration in high school. Katie, do these advancements usually come from the school pushing the kid forward or from the parent pushing the kid forward? And what are some of the results and consequences of, of either side? Yeah, I think acceleration works best when it is a community effort where it's not no one really pushing the child. It's really about seeing what the child is ready for. And you have students that have advanced, abil advanced abilities and they're highly motivated to learn. And what you want to do is put them into an environment where they have the opportunity to learn something new every day. And it works best when you have a school and a parent um, and a child who all want to do that and who are all on board. I think whether that idea initially comes from the parent or initially comes from the school or initially comes from the child depends on the information that's out there and what resources parents have. And that's part of um, one of the, the projects that I've done, this, this careers work that I've done recently was published um, this month in a two volume set called A Nation Empowered. They came out from the Bell and Blank Center at the University of Iowa. And again, I said, I have a chapter in that volume, but it's really designed to help parents and educators and give them that research-based evidence that's, that shows the support of acceleration that they can use to advocate for their student and to follow processes of 
how to successfully accelerate students such that you do see those positive academic achievement outcomes, positive social emotional outcomes as well. Looking at the students that are in my high school, they are very academically challenged. And, you know, we have a 4.0 scale, but I think the most that our students can get is like a 4.6 or a 4.7. These kids are in nine AP classes in an eight period day. They're going at it so fast. The stress level that these kids are under is amazing. I mean, every year so far, and I've been there eight years, I've had at least one or two kids crying in, the, in, in our music wing because of the pressures that they're under. Should we be putting kids in a position where they're not emotionally ready for it? They're not maturely ready for it? I mean, what what is what happens to these kids when they are put in a situation? I know you had mentioned the three D's. What happens to these kids from all, all those points of views? Yeah. Um, and most of the research will show really positive effects of academic acceleration. So they do. Uh, my chapter shows they they if they're talking about getting jobs, they're getting higher salaries, they're increasing their salaries faster, they're getting more prestigious jobs. Um, you see similar research coming from other groups um, out of Vanderbilt University, those students that were accelerated are having more publications, more highly cited publications, a bigger impact in STEM fields than similar high ability students that weren't accelerated. Um, and you see positive social outcomes too, and that a lot of times these advanced students are more mature and actually feel more comfortable with other like-minded peers, even if that's not the same chronological age. So the research would suggest that there are a lot of positive effects, but I think one of the terms that you used in terms of pushing students is really what, what we wanna be careful about. It's really about what is the student ready for? What are they wanting to do? What is that next step? And opening the doors to allow them to do it, um, but not to really say that you have to take eight AP courses or you have to take, I think that's where the pressure comes in, but it's really about um, providing opportunities for students so that they can learn at the pace that's um, commensurate with their ability and, and with where they want to go. Now, you just had mentioned students that are trying to be, let me see if I got this right, socially or academically with older students. I mean, we always are also very nervous about those freshmen that are hanging out with the juniors and seniors for both positive and negative reasons. Uh, are we looking at the students from their academic only, or are we looking at them from that full emotional, psychological gamut going, is this kid ready to be in, in an older grade, sitting in a math classroom with kids that are four years older? Yep, you wanna look at it from both. You wanna look at it from the academic side. You also wanna look at it from their um, social emotional preparation side and also from sort of the psychological side, how they feel about themselves and are they ready for that kind of step. So there's a lot of factors that you wanna take into account when you make that decision. But the research will say that um, students, for example, a lot of universities have sort of a talent search model where they allow students to come in for a summer and experience university life or they offer Saturday programs. And again, you'll have students of multiple ages that will all be brought together because they'll want to learn about computer programming or have some you know, experience like that in the summer. And the students have very positive experiences. They report um, positively about the experiences at the time and looking back on their acceleration experiences, they have very positive reports. Um, even the students, I was at a talk last week given by um, some colleagues at the University of Washington talking about that early entrance program where they've got 14, 15, 16 year olds in a cohort experiencing university starting college. They all, you know, even 20 years later are reporting back majority positively about that experience and about um, being with peers who have similar values about education and, and about, you know, working together and having that, that type of friendships that they formed as part of those groups. With your research, just curious here, is there any research that's being done about kids either in a public or private school skipping a grade or being in a really advanced versus homeschool and taking online lessons? I would think that it might be easier to be home and working on a 12th grade level than being 14 years old with a bunch of 18 year olds. Is, where are we with, with all the technology these days? Yeah, so I think technology has opened up a lot of opportunities for acceleration and for other um, other learning opportunities, enrichment or whatever that didn't exist before. Um, 
for example, I grew up in Iowa. I live in Texas now, but I grew up in Iowa and there's a lot of rural schools in Iowa that don't have the same access and, and offerings of AP courses that sounds like are at your school or at several other schools. And so there is an Iowa and Iowa online AP Academy. And so that gives the, it brings that opportunity for students to have access to those higher level courses um, through their school. Again, I think the question about is it easier to take a to homeschool and take these courses versus being in a classroom with different kids when you're thinking about acceleration. There are a lot of different. There's 20 different types of acceleration and some of those types have more. They're more obvious than others. So a grade skipping or putting a 14 year old in the you know calculus class with the 18 year olds is something that's more salient, but there are other options for acceleration. Um, such as curriculum compacting, where you can pretest the student and understand sort of what, what material they've already mastered and eliminate that from the curriculum, compact the rest of it, and then you have time left to really expand for that student or for those group of students. And that doesn't have to be as um, salient, as obvious that that's, that that's a difference. And so there's a lot of different dimensions of acceleration when trying to think about what's the right fit for that child. I, I think I want to go back to a question I probably should have asked you at the start of this show. Can you define the term gifted? Because I think there's a lot of parents out there that, that really don't know what that means. They just see other children being treated differently. What is your definition? Um, there is no, like every state has their own definition of gifted and most of the time it's left up to the districts for who would qualify. So I don't know that I use that term in particular. The National Association for Gifted Children will talk about a definition of students that have high academic potential or high achievement in a bunch of different domains. And that it's about, I think, three to 5% um, percent of the population would, would qualify under that type of a definition. I think when we're talking about acceleration, it's really about trying to identify not so much a label of gifted, but really a student who has um, high aptitude has high achievement, and so you've got sort of this ability that makes them a likely candidate for acceleration. And again, this, this desire to learn and to move at the faster pace. And so you've got those types of characteristics, I think, are more important than a definition or a categorization of gifted, per se. One of the things that I was looking at over here is this website where you had uh, helped um, I, I guess author some content here called A Nation Empowered. Talk to yes. us a little bit about this here. This is really, really fascinating stuff. Yeah, so this, this publication um, was just released this month and it's a 10 year follow up to a publication called A Nation Deceived, How America Holds Back Its Brightest Students. And that came out in 2004, um, again, from the University of Iowa and the Bell and Blank Center, really starting the dialogue and conversation about acceleration and acceleration as an intervention. It's one of the most, um, it's got the most research evidence behind it and probably one of the least implemented interventions. And so that, that first publication 10 years ago really started that conversation. A Nation Empowered was now a follow-up to that. And so there's, there's two volumes and A Nation Deceived was the same way. And the first volume is really aimed at educators, policymakers. Um, it's written in a very user-friendly way in that if you're not a researcher, um, there's not a ton of citations or, you know, there are no formulas. All of that is really comp contained in volume two. And so in volume two, I think there's 22 chapters that really are the research evidence behind the first volume. And so they go together nicely as a set. And that's really helping give um, parents and, and educators being able to empower them with the information that they need to be able to successfully advocate for and implement acceleration strategies. Well, looking down here at the bottom, it says essential questions. And let me see if I can throw a couple of these at you. But one of the essential questions is, have we assessed the student's ability correctly? How, if, if I have a child and I have three, and of course all of my kids are gifted, how do I know? What, what is the process that I would bring a child to you or to somebody to say, does my student qualify? They're 17 months old, by the way. Okay. <laughs> That's right. The triplets. Um, so I think that there's a couple different tests that are frequently used. One of the most frequently used tests to try and decide if acceleration is a good option is called above level testing. And this is the idea. Most of our testing these days, if you've got a first grader and I've got a first grader, um, is tests of first grade content or a third grader takes a test of third grade content. When you give an above level test, you allow that third grader to take content that's fourth, fifth, sixth, or seventh grade 
So that above level content. And that's how you really can help decide what does a student know and what are they ready to learn next? And you may through that above level testing learn that your student really is ready for fourth grade math or fifth grade math or something like that, that you wouldn't get if you were just focused on the grade level content. So if you're ending up, um, there's an there's a example of a student in the Nation Empowered who in, I think it was in fifth grade, had a perfect score on the Explore test, which is designed for eighth grade students, and was scoring in the 99th percentile on their grade level assessment. And so that doesn't give you very much information as a parent, as an educator, about what to do with that student because they've really topped out of the test. And so by giving them that above level test, it helps you really better define where are their strengths and weaknesses, and they don't have sort of that, that sometimes we call high flat profile, where you have you know, you're good at absolutely everything, but by taking those above level tests, you can get a feel for where are your strengths and weaknesses, relative strengths and weaknesses, because you have a higher ceiling. Now, I want to make sure I'm using your terms. You're saying content level. You're not, is this the same thing as reading level where we say my kid is in third grade, but he's reading on a sixth grade level or reading on a, is this the same stuff or my kid's in third grade, but he knows all about the constitution and that's a sixth grade concept is, what is what do you what do you mean by content level? Yeah, so by content level, sort of thinking about for, for every state, there are the the content standards that a student should master at that grade level, and then there's standards at at above level. And I think for mathematics or for reading, those are easier places where you see that progression of content. And so you can say if your student is doing you know algebra in third grade, that's above level content, depending on the you know the type of algebra, their high pre-algebra skills. But that's really what we're thinking about in terms of above level testing. It tends to be a reading mathematics. Um, social studies doesn't seem to have that same progression of content. Is it easy or difficult for a kid to pick this up? I would think that any third or fourth grader that really knows how to use YouTube might be able to go on and learn some algebra or pre-algebra by watching content and content and content. Is this where students are picking these things up or are there other ways that you're seeing third through fifth graders learn these high school math and science skills? A lot of times students will pick up, I mean, a lot of times you'll find a student that should be accelerated probably started reading when they were two or three. And they didn't get that from, you know, a parent necessarily sitting down and trying to teach them the alphabet or watching a video on YouTube. These are things that they pick up, that they have sort of a, an ability for or that they maybe have been taught or have had other exposure for. Um, but again, you wouldn't want it to be in sort of a single, a single domain. You really want to look and see sort of across the board in terms of mathematics, what do they know? Where would that place them? And is that really a good fit? Is that the next thing for them to learn? Um, th the goal is really so that students aren't spending as much time in the classroom bored or having to, to relearn things that they've already learned. The biggest, one of the biggest challenges when you see a high, high ability, highly able student who underperforms is typically because they're bored in the classroom and they're not seeing a challenge. And so the idea is trying to continue to find the content that will challenge that child. And you may be able to do that by differentiating within the, within the classroom environment that exists. You may be able to compact the curriculum that that student has to do to be able to give them some additional content within the class or it may be something that the, the better strategy is to move them into into a different classroom or into a different group or into a different um, environment to be able to give them that that extra learning whether that's done through an online you know computer module or whether that's done by going to a different class within that school this is amazingly fascinating to me by the way and so that, if, if the questions are all over the place that's because my, my mind is completely firing on all these different topics here I, I I'm, I'm curious about a few things you know coming from the music world we see students who are amazingly talented on the violin and you know mm -hmm. th three-year-olds who are playing yep. these Mozart concertos and what always ends up happening with those three-year-olds with the Mozart concertos is you have the parents that are pushing and pushing and pushing. Do you have the opportunity to do research on the family units of, of students that are up there? You know, maybe mom says, my kid is gifted and talented, and you're like, maybe not. Or the mom that's, you know, look, my kid's gotta graduate with his doctorate by the time he's 14. What is the parent structure like, or what, what should be the parent structure like if you do have a student that's gifted and talented and able to uh, get access to some of these great resources? 
Yeah, I think that's a wonderful question. And I would say I have not done direct research. I've not had the opportunity to do direct research with a bunch of different families, but I would point out a couple things. One, I think um, students who excel in any area, whether that is music or sports or academics, tend to have some pretty strong supporters that have enabled them to be able to do that and have helped them through you know, some of the deliberate practice ideas, right? Of here's how you get better, here's the thing that you have to practice um, through that support. And so I do think that the parents or educators play a role in helping to develop that talent for students. I think one of the, the things that, one of the misconceptions that we have when we think about gifted students is that they are coming from, you know, sort of more affluent families that have a lot of parental support and that are pushing their children. I think that we also need to make sure that we remember, um, you know, high ability students come from all sort of different backgrounds. And there's a lot of students in more of a low income or families have less resources and maybe aren't aware of these different opportunities or don't know that their students could benefit from being able to see some of those accelerations or being exposed to that higher level content. And so I think it's important um, as schools that, that we that we continue to give those opportunities to students, whereas in music or in sports, you know, you may take extracurricular and enrichment activities outside of school, music lessons and, you know, uh, sports teams and traveling teams to be able to continue to build up your student. In academics, there are those opportunities as well, but sometimes for families with, with fewer resources, those aren't available. And so the school can be able to provide additional learning opportunities really without a ton of extra cost if students can you know, go to a higher level class for one period a day or you know, be provided with an, with an online um, resource for learning new material. Speaking today with Katie McClarty, who is the uh, who works for Pearson and the college, sorry, the Center for College and Career Success. Just backing up on what you were talking about, let's say that I am in some part of the country and my school district doesn't have those resources or doesn't have a teacher that specialized in exactly what my student needs. You know, we we hear all the time in the music world of parents pick up and they come to New York and they put their kid in Juilliard prep. Where can you help me? focus a parent's resources if they are in a position where they want to get their student uh, tested, I might be the term, or just looking for some help and answers? Sure. Um, on my website, on the center website, there is an FAQ, um, sort of frequently asked questions about gifted education, and there's a box on there that talks about some of the places to go for more resources, like the Bell and Blank Center at the University of Iowa has a clinic the Davidson Institute. There are several um, resources there of places where parents can go. But I would say there are lots of universities that offer programs, either summer programs or Saturday programs. And there again, you, you might wanna be close by, but when I worked in summer programs in Iowa, we would have kids from Texas that would fly up for a week or two in the summer and be able to take advantage. And universities have also started providing those same opportunities online so that people can access them remotely if you don't have the ability to travel you know, across the state or to a different state to participate in a program like that in the summer. They're starting to offer um, those programs online. And um, like Duke has a set of summer programs, but they have them in lots of different locations throughout the country. So you don't have to go to the Duke campus to be able to take advantage of those. So I think, um, I think universities are really trying to open up those opportunities more to students who are in areas where they wouldn't have previously had those opportunities. I, I got to tell you, this is amazingly fascinating stuff to me. I want to ask you one more topic here. If I was a school leader and I know that in my, you know, in my younger grades, I had a few or, you know, one or two kids that were potentially able to do these types of programs and I needed to hire somebody. What am I looking for in somebody to come into my school district? What's, what's your advice on, hiring them? What kind of skills do I look for? Where do I find these teachers to help out my students who are gifted and talented? I think, I think there are a lot of um, programs and resources available. And I think um, it's a good question. I, I've got a couple different answers in my, in my head as, as you ask it. So on the one hand, I would say, um, I think all educators are trying to do the best for the students that they have and be able to meet the needs of the diversity of learners that they have in their classroom. And so there are a lot of strategies that I think um, educators are taught in terms of differentiation and learning strategies 
that will help them with all of their, you know, with their able learners in their classroom. In terms of having sort of specialties, in terms of thinking about gifted and talented, I think I think there's a lot of um, there are a lot of colleges of ed that have started to offer programs or certifications in this area, um, or an add-on certification in terms of a gifted credential. So I think those are areas there, or having teachers take some professional development courses in these areas, you can start to learn more about the characteristics of these students to understand them better. I mean, a student that that is a good candidate for acceleration doesn't need to be scoring perfect in your class in order to be a good candidate to move ahead. And you know, learning that sometimes if you see a student who's um, not completing assignments or staring out the window might not be because they don't understand the work, but because they're bored and don't want to complete the work. So I think there's um, some understanding of how those behaviors would manifest themselves in the classroom. Um, some of the stereotypes we have about gifted learners of being the students who you know are there with their you know pencil ready to go ready to to answer all of the questions and, and get all the answers right I, I used to say it's not that um i, I used to work with an elementary group of, of gifted students and i said you know it's not that they don't get in trouble it's that they find even more creative ways to get in trouble so i think um helping people understand what those characteristics of the students are and then knowing what the programming options are even knowing that you know, grade skipping may be something that you want to do, but that might not be the right solution. There's other, you know, acceleration options. There's grade, you know, I talked about curriculum compacting, there's telescoping, there's, um, you know, single subject acceleration. So there's a variety of options that are available. And I think part of what a nation empowered does going through the chapters too, is talking about all of those different options. So there's a lot of different ways that you can really meet the needs of individual students. Katie, do you feel that this is nature or nurture? What side of the fence is all this on? For a kid to be so super smart, is this born into them? Or can, can my can my kid who's very, very book smart and has read The Lord of the Rings 13 times over the summer, can they then become gifted and talented on their own nature? Yeah, I don't think that it's – I think it's both. I think that um, – I think that students, there are students who have sort of a, a natural talent and you would see that from like a two-year-old that's learning to read, um, you know, or that can read and so you'll see some of that early development. But I also think that nature plays a really big role in helping students develop those talents and giving them the opportunities and for them to have the motivation themselves. I think to ultimately develop into, you know, talented adults or to have those success, it's not just about having sort of an innate ability. I think that you know, helps, but it also has to be that um, practice and the opportunities and being able to have those type of experiences. And so that's why I'm fairly passionate about this topic is being able to give students those opportunities that we know through a decade of research have really positive effects in terms of their subsequent academic and professional outcomes. Katie, I got to tell you, I've got about 100 more questions for you. But before we before we wrap up today, tell us a little bit about what you're doing now. Where, where is your research heading you or where do you hope your research is heading you? And what are the questions that you're really trying to find out in the next two years, five years? Sure. I've got a couple different research projects in this area that I'm that I'm working on next. Um, this work on acceleration has also really led me to think about how gifted students are identified and defined and served around the world. So you'd ask that question about what is gifted and how is it defined? That's a really big um, question in the field and people have different answers for that. And so I'm looking at how is that happening around the world and how are they serving their students and how is that related to student performance and what can we learn um, in other countries? And so that's one of my big projects right now. And then I'm also interested in intervention strategies. So again, I think um, there, there's a concept of the twice exceptional learner. So this is a student who has been identified as gifted but also has a learning disability. And again, I think that's a group that people don't think about a lot. They typically think about those as being too separate, that that can't coexist, and they can. And so trying to figure out, I'm working on a, a project um, looking at intervention strategies for students who are gifted, but also have ADHD, and how can we help um, reduce some of those ADHD symptoms through some interventions and help um, on the academic side. So those are two of my my big projects over the next year or so. Speaking today with Katie McClarty, where, of course, you can catch her on Twitter over at Katie McClarty. Can you talk to us a little bit about Pearson, some of the stuff that's going on there and uh, and how people can reach out to meet you and, and, and get some information? 
Sure. Like I said, we are um, a very diverse group of researchers and, and organization. I'll say that um, just within our center alone, we've got research related to what I call our four-part mission statement. So we want to identify and measure the skills that students need to be successful. So we're looking at how do we um, identify 21st century skills? How do we measure critical thinking, um, global competency, creativity? We're looking at um, pathways that students take to be successful. So thinking about what does it take if we know where we need to be at the end, where do we need to be in high school, in middle school, in elementary school, we're working on um, middle school indicators of college readiness to be able to develop more of an early warning system, looking beyond academic achievement, but also at behavior, motivation, social engagement, some of those other factors that are important. We look at how to track progress along that pathway. So once we have a pathway, how do we track whether you're on, on track or not? Um, looking at that both through statistical modeling, but also through content and learning progressions. And then, of course, the fourth piece is the effective strategies and interventions to keep students on track or to get them back on track. So some of the intervention work and this acceleration work both fit into there. So that's just our um, center. But like I said, we've got a lot of projects um, going on about um, we've got some resources up on the website about flipped learning. So how do you how do you effectively take your classroom and, and use the flipped learning model? We've got um, how do we incorporate performance assessments and game based tasks? into a curricular, into a classroom so that you've got um, multiple sources of information about your students. How do we develop better score reports that can give better information back to teachers about what the next step should be that they take with children? So I, I could go on probably for another 45 minutes just with different research topics that we have going on in the network, but it really is all in the service of trying to, to make a difference for students and move the needle in education. I, I think that's great. We've just come up with a part two to this podcast. I, <laughs> I, 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 I swear I've got about another hundred questions here. One of the things that I'm thinking about is like right now I've got kids that are taking SAT prep courses to get better grades on the test. Is there a course that's designed to pass the gifted test? And if so, can I as my as a teacher train my students on how to skip a grade? Um, or am I thinking about this completely different? No, I think – again, I think it's not about trying to um, – game a system to skip a grade to get out of school. It's really about trying to put students in the place where, they, where they're where they ready to learn. If a student has already mastered, if you've got that first grader and they're reading at the third grade level, having them sit through a year of first grade reading probably isn't going to help advance them and they're ready to go to that next level. Um, and I think there's a difference between you know teaching students mathematics content so that they can learn the content and they're ready for the next content and teaching um, test taking strategies. So I always try to separate those two things, um, you know, learning how to be a faster person of filling in bubbles, which I like to tell people it's actually inside out. Um, when I was when I was in seventh grade and I was taking the SAT, my mother would probably hate that I say this. My mom got me this book about taking the SAT and test prep. And there was a whole section on the fastest way to fill in bubbles. And so I tell people that sort of as a joke because I don't think that filling in bubbles faster really represents anything about my mathematics or my reading achievement or any of those abilities, right? What I need to be doing is trying to understand content more. And you see that through like the redesign of the SAT. They've taken out some of the aspects um, that they felt like students could just study a dictionary to learn because that's not, that's not what they're trying to measure was not ability to read and memorize words out of a dictionary. It was really being able to understand literature. And so you're seeing assessments change to try to reflect the knowledge and skills that we really want students to have and those experiences that we want students to have. You start to see more of the performance-based assessments where students are completing authentic tasks because that's what we want them to be able to do. And so you've seen that shift, I think, in assessment and we'll continue to see it because it's not about trying to um, you know, do a test prep book or course. It's about trying to help students really learn that deep content. Katie, you were amazing. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Before I let you go, I have a question for you that I only am looking for a one-word answer. Should I accelerate my gifted child? Yes. Katie, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you.
And thank you for taking the time to join us today on the TeacherCast podcast. I want to thank again our friends from Pearson for coming on the show and uh, sharing this amazing content with us. There's, of course, several great ways that you can connect with us each and every week on our show. You can find us on Twitter at TeacherCast. Leave us a voicemail over at TeacherCast.net slash voicemail. Email us at feedback at TeacherCast.net. And this show would not survive without ratings and reviews from you guys. Please check us out and subscribe over at TeacherCast.net slash iTunes and teachercast.net slash YouTube. My name is Jeff Bradbury. Until next time, keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students.